You're listening to The Jacob Volk Show. He's breaking down the latest and greatest in sports as only he can. Follow him on Twitter at Real Jacob Volk. Here he is, Jacob Volk. of the Jacob Volk Show. I am the Jacob Volk. And at the end of this show, you're going to get the chat that I had with Sarah Albertson. Really, really good friend of mine. Great Rangers fan. Haven't spoken to her in a while. It was nice to get back in touch with her. It was great to get her perspective on everything that's happened with the Rangers recently. But I have to start with the end of an era. One of the best players in baseball history. We don't think of this guy in this way, but he is. There's no question about it is nearing the end of his career. That is Albert Pujols. He has been DFA'd by the Angels. Presumably, he's just going to be released. Is it possible that the Angels could work out a trade where they eat the vast majority of the $30 million that Pulhos is owed? Yes, it is, but I don't see that happening. It seems like the man with the 14th most hits, 5th most home runs, and 3rd most RBIs, in MLB history, is going to be a free agent. As surprising as this move is, you can't begrudge the Angels for making it. Poolhouse has not been good this year. He's hitting under 200. He only has 5 home runs and 12 RBIs. His presence at first base meant that Jared Walsh, who is having an outstanding start to the season, he's hitting .330 with six homers and 22 RBIs, has been forced into playing right field. He's not as good a right fielder as he is a first baseman. If you're the Angels, you do want Walsh playing first base in a perfect world. And he obviously can't put Poolhouse at DH because you have Shohei Otani and you need to keep his bat in the lineup as much as possible. He's leading the majors in home runs right now with 10. It's certainly an ignominious end to Poolhouse's Angels career. There's no question. I mean, let's be honest. Albert Pujols, after he signed that huge contract in 2012, 10 years, 240 mil, him and C.J. Wilson, who the Angels signed that same offseason, were going to bring the Angels back to a World Series They haven't gotten anywhere close. How's this for a stat? With Albert Pujols as an angel, they haven't won a game in the postseason. They only made it once. That was in 2014 when they won the AL West. 
They faced the Royals in the ALDS. They got swept. Pujols was not good in that series. He only had two hits. That signing that caused shockwaves all throughout baseball failed miserably for the Angels. Pujols had a disappointing career. The guy only made one All-Star game. This is a guy who in his 11 years with the Cardinals made nine All-Star games. He was a three-time MVP with the Cardinals. You know how many times Pujols got in the top 15 of AL MVP voting? None. It never happened. He placed in the top 17 twice. But that's not good enough. Only making one All-Star game? That's not good enough. Pulhos doesn't have the right to be upset at the Angels for moving on from him. The reality is no one has the right to be upset over it. It makes sense. The only bad thing about it is it's a dishonorable end to his career. It's a shame that he couldn't go out with his head held high like Derek Jeter or David Wright. And instead, he had to go out like Alex Rodriguez. That's the only thing that's bad about this. Pulhos did deserve better. A future Hall of Famer does deserve better. But did the Angels owe it to him? Not really. I mean, Pulhos could have hung it up after last year. He was 40. He did not have a good year in the shortened season. You could tell he was nearing the end of the line. And he could have avoided this. Now, I'm not knocking Pulhos. I have the utmost respect for Albert Pulhos' career. My buddy Nick asked me if I could have added one player to the Yankees that I saw play, who would it be? This was a long time ago. I said Pulhos. He's a first ballot Hall of Famer. He's going to be right up there with Jeter and Griffey and Seaver and Mariano in terms of total vote percentage. He is in the inner sanctum. Of Hall of Famers. It is worth noting that Pulhos signed the third richest contract in baseball history at the time. The guy spent half his career with the Angels and really didn't do much for him. His Angels tenure was a disappointment, make no mistake about it. Does that take away from what he did with the Cardinals? Maybe a little bit, but certainly not enough to deprive him of all the accolades that he's going to get. Like I said, he's going into the Hall of Fame. He's going in first ballot. My guess is the Cardinals will retire his number at some point. But it is upsetting that Pulhos couldn't duplicate his success that he had with the Cardinals with the Angels. It is sad that the Angels had no choice but to release him. At least this is the final year of his contract. When the Yankees sent A-Rod packing, he had a full year left. So at least the Angels are avoiding that. There were a few teams that I thought of for Pulhos if he does want to finish out the year. 
I'll knock one of them out really quickly. It would be a very Yankees-like thing for them to bring in a future Hall of Famer at the end of his career so that they can have another guy in Cooperstown, but it's not going to happen. The Yankees have Stanton as their DH. He's absolutely raking right now. He is their best hitter right now, and Luke Voigt's going to be back soon. So unless Poolhouse wants to be the backup first baseman slash pinch hitter, I don't see it. I mean, there was a report from Mike DiGiovanna of the LA Times that said the pool host was ticked off that he was benched against Ryan Yarborough, who he's had success against in the past, and that it was the front office that benched him, not Joe Madden. Mr. Poolhos, you don't have a right to be upset over that when you're hitting under 200. Legacy can only get you so far. I mean, you could tell that Pulhos' playing time was going to be reduced. When guys like Joe Adele and Brandon Marsh are ready to come up, where does Pulhos fit in? The Angels don't owe anything to Pulhos. They gave him the third biggest contract in baseball history at the time, and he only gave them one All-Star appearance. That's not good enough. You know, it ticks me off that this is how Poolhouse went out for the Angels. With him calling for more playing time and not getting to leave with his head held high. I'm not an Angels fan by any stretch, but I'm a baseball fan. I have the utmost respect for Albert Poolhouse. But this is how you want to go out? Calling for more playing time? Getting upset at the front office when you get benched? Come on, you can't do that. You can't leave on a sour note like that. That just leaves a bad taste in everyone's mouths. It's really upsetting to me. It honestly is. The two other teams that I thought of for pool hosts were the Cardinals and White Sox. I really don't need to explain to you why the Cardinals popped into my head. But they have Paul Goldschmidt. Unless pool host wants to be a bat off the bench, he's not going back to St. Louis. I thought about the White Sox to play under Tony La Russa again. But they have Jose Abreu as their first baseman. They have Yerman Mercedes as their DH, who's gotten off to an insane start. See, that's the thing. If Pulhos wants to continue his career, he's got to be willing to be a backup. Swallow your pride if that's what you really want. That's all you deserve at this point. You can't go out calling for more playing time when you don't deserve it. I don't want that to be the last thing I remember about you. If that's how you go out, wanting playing time, trying to force your way into the lineup when you really don't deserve it, that's what I'm going to remember. About your Angels career. Not the great charity work. Not the all-star season where you hit 40 home runs. If this is the end of the line for Poolhouse. Okay. I don't mind it. It's not the best way to go out. Obviously. But when you're done, you're done. There's no sense in pushing it if you don't have to. But if he's going to latch on to another team, 
he's got to buy into whatever role his manager assigns to him. I'd be stunned if a team named him their starting first baseman or DH. I think the best that Pulhos can hope for is backup first baseman slash pinch hitter. If that's not what you want to do, then right off into the sunset, start your five years. You had an excellent career. 3,253 hits, 667 home runs, 2,112 RBIs, and you're retiring as the all-time leader in a category. Not everyone can do that. You know what that category is? Most times grounding into double plays. You did that 403 times. That is the most in baseball history. I mean, that's one of those things where if you last long enough to ground into that many double plays, you're doing something right. Just to give you a point of reference... The top nine are all Hall of Famers. You've got Poolhouse, then Ripken, Irod, Hank Aaron, Miguel Cabrera, Yaz, Mr. May, Eddie Murray, and Jim Rice. Those guys are all in the Hall of Fame, except for Poolhouse and Cabrera, but they're going to go into the Hall of Fame. It's certainly sad that this is how your career ended. There's no question. But you know what? You can go on your baseball reference page. Look at all the bold type you have from your Cardinals days and say, you know what? I did it right. All right, now I'll give you some NFL vault talk. And I'll start with the Dolphins splitting up the McCourties. Jason McCourty is now a Dolphin. He signed a one-year deal, and it's a good move. Did McCourty have a good year for the Patriots last year? The answer is no. He had a 55.7 overall grade, according to Pro Football Focus. The year before, though, he had a 74.4 overall grade. The guy's been a good corner in this league for a long time. I mean, realize the Dolphins cut Bobby McCain. They lost a really good veteran presence in the locker room. Now they're adding a guy who can be their fourth corner and hold his own, playing behind Byron Jones, Xavier Howard, and Noah Igbenogany. He's a veteran that will help out a very young Dolphins team. Obviously, the Dolphins like him because he's a former Patriot. And Brian Flores did used to coach him with the Patriots. He had McCourty in 2018. The move makes sense. It's a good job by the Dolphins. All right, here's my chat with Sarah Albertson. You're listening to the Jacob Volk Show. I am Jacob Volk. And right now I'm joined by a friend of mine who I haven't spoken to in years. It's been way too long. One of the best Rangers fans there is. It's Sarah Albertson. Sarah, how are you? Okay? I'm doing well, Jacob. How are you? I'm doing good. Uh, So the reason that I wanted to talk to you is because I wanted to rub your nose in the fact that the Islanders beat the Rangers last week. Give me your thoughts. No, I'm only kidding. Um, (laughs) The Tom Wilson hit, I can't even say hit, the Tom Wilson barbarism on Pavel Buknevich and um, Artemi Panarin um, is still 
very, very much seared into hockey fans' minds. Even as an Islanders fan, I thought it was sickening. I can't imagine what it must have felt like to a Rangers fan. When you first saw it happening, what was going through your mind? I just couldn't believe it. I honestly was like, wait a second, are we watching hockey or are we watching UFC? Because the way um, <laughs> Panarin went down, like it was like a body slam. It wasn't even like a normal check, like a normal anything. Right. Right, absolutely. There's no place for that in the NHL. That's something that um, I could only see someone doing in the WWE. Do you have to have Vince McMahon's phone number? Tom Wilson needs a tryout. I mean, <laughs> my goodness gracious. Um, do you think that Tom Wilson should be banned from the NHL? I think he should because he is a repeated offender. Um, you know, and usually um, players with this kind of behavior, they tend to keep going. And especially in this instance where he's getting a lot of attention and he did not have to suffer any kind of severe penalties due to the hit he um, put on Panarin and Bush, I think that he's going to keep doing it, and he's going to keep doing it until, you know, somebody puts a stop to it. He's going to stop when he kills someone. That's when he's going to stop. Let's be honest. That's oh, yeah. the only thing that's going to make him stop, when he seriously kills someone. And don't tell me that's out of the realm of possibility. Tom Wilson almost killed Pavel Buknevich and Artemi Panarin the other night. I'm sure you'd agree with that. Oh, I 100% agree with that. You know, there's a line. Um, you know, hockey is supposed to be tough, okay? They're supposed to be a little rough. They're supposed to give it their all on the ice, but there's a line, and you just don't cross the line, and Wilson crossed it. Like the goons of old, guys like Bobby Probert, Chris Nyland, Dave Schultz, Tiger Williams, there was a sense of decorum there. They knew what they could do and what they couldn't do. This guy knows nothing about the etiquette of fighting, there is an etiquette to being a tough guy in the NHL. You know, I, I, what I wouldn't give for someone like Clark Gillies, who was a really tough hockey player, went toe-to-toe with Dave Schultz famously, to sit down with Tom Wilson and tell him, hey, you know, this is how you need to act if you're going to be a tough guy. I think that Wilson needs a real kick in the rear end from someone. What are your thoughts on that? Let me hear. I think he needs um, a kick in the butt, too. But, you know, uh, the big part of this issue, it's very controversial, is when he made that hit, the NHL um, Player Safety Organization, you know, was like, it's not that bad, it's not that severe. And it's sending the wrong message, especially to Wilson, because it's like, oh, you know, I only had to pay $15,000 for this fine, but I don't get to lose any game time. And $15,000 is... Not even, I don't even think like 1% of his salary from what I was reading. Right. He's on a $31.6 million contract with the Capitals. I mean, it wasn't anything. It was like pocket money, like change that, you know, Wilson was handing out. So I just feel like, you know, when he committed that hit and then, you know, they all played it off in the NHL, I was like, oh, not a big deal. Like, you know, it's not as severe as people are making it. It was sending the wrong message to Wilson because now he thinks this type of behavior he can continue with. Let me ask you something. What do you say to the people who say that every GM in the NHL would take Tom Wilson on their team? I say absolutely not. And the reason that it's coming from a Rangers fan's viewpoint, all right, we had Tony D'Angelo. And, yes, regardless of his political um, issues and his political stances and beliefs, he got into an altercation with our goalie. Um, after a game one night, and then that was it. Our GM was like, you're done. Like, put him on the taxi squad. He hasn't played a game since. Like, that was one physical altercation that was not even nearly as bad as the one that Wilson put on. And we were like, nope, you're done, you're gone. And it's like, you know, I don't see us as a team, just us out of many teams on the on the um, NHL, that we would sign somebody like that. Because you know what? Like, we got rid of Tony D'Angelo with something that wasn't even as severe. So it's like, I can't see us signing somebody like Wilson. I'm so telling you right now. I'm telling you right now, if Tom Wilson became an Islander, I'd have a real tough time rooting for him. I would want him to fail every time he stepped on the ice. He, you just, you can't root for someone like that. You know, this guy is seriously, I, I keep repeating myself, he's going to kill someone. Tom Wilson is seriously going to kill someone on the ice. Marty McSorley, 
almost killed Donald Brashear, Tom Wilson is going to murder someone. Now, you brought up the $5,000 fine that Wilson got. Obviously, we all know that that's a drop in the bucket. I can't even call it a slap on the wrist because it's not a real punishment, let's be honest. Um, The Rangers made a statement basically killing the NHL, the NHL's uh, Department of Player Safety, the head of player safety, George Paros. I know you saw it. Give me your thoughts on the statement. So I think the Rangers did the right thing. They made the statement, and I'm very sure that before they released that statement, they knew what trouble that they were going to get into, meaning that they knew they were going to get fined, but they knew that the fine was nothing. And what I mean by nothing is the statement and the stance they were, was more important and bigger than the fine. So you know what? That fine, that money was well spent because you know what? The Rangers are trying to be the change in the league. They're trying to stop this behavior. They're trying to protect players. So you know what? Fine us all you want, and money's not going to change the fact about how we feel about player safety. What are your thoughts on a guy like George Paro, who was a really tough player, an enforcer, a goon, call him whatever you want, making that kind of a statement to Wilson that your conduct is more or less okay, we're just going to find you a measly amount. $5,000 is measly for a guy like Wilson. What are your thoughts on that? So George Peros, he was a former NHL player. And, you know, I look at him and what the time period that he played. And when he played, he played in a different era, I want to almost basically call it, because like he played with the old timers. He played when rules were different, when certain violence and certain actions were okay. So, you know, he played in a time where it's not the same as it is now. And I think that he needs to adjust his viewing and his rules to be with the current way the NHL is and the current safety rules is and not the way it was back then. You know, I just keep going back to Islanders Penguins in 2011 fight night over 300 penalty minutes um, and the mayhem that that was. And George Paros basically signaling to the Rangers, if you want retribution for what Wilson did to Bucknevich and Panarin, I'm not going to help you. You need to do it yourself. Correct me if I'm wrong, Sarah, but isn't the job of the Department of Player Safety to discipline players when they act unsafely? Yes, it is. But sadly, we're in a world where money and politics talks. So, you know, on perils is end, it's like, hey, you know, if you decide to go fight to get your retribution, it can help with viewership. It gets fans to engage, such as on social media. You know, off of this stuff. So, you know, sometimes George Perils isn't really looking out for the safety of the players, but he's looking out for NHL's profitability. Let me ask you something. Do you think he favors the goons more than the star players? That's honestly um, a tough question. I mean, hockey fights definitely draw in more attention, especially in the media and in the crowds. So, yeah, I think that he does, I believe, give a lot attention to the goons, because especially if the goons take on a star player, like that's making highlights. Um, honestly, I don't think that right now he's in the best interest of any of the stars, but honestly, at the end of the day, I don't think he's completely against the stars either. Okay, so in the midst of all this, and we're talking to Sarah Albertson, great friend of mine, big New York Rangers fan, in the midst of all of this, John Davidson and Jeff Gordon – get fired as president and GM of the Rangers, respectively. From the outside looking in, I was very surprised. What were your thoughts on them being canned? Okay, so I honestly, I was shocked. I did not see that coming, personally. Honestly, there's only two games left in the season. So, like, I don't understand why the team couldn't wait and the last two games ended and then fire those two. Because, you know, it really doesn't make any sense. Because, yes, Chris Thurry did move up to GM and president, but he's only going to have two days in this season, and then they're going to go to preseason in the summer camps. So it just really didn't make any sense. Because, like, if there was a couple months left in the season, I could understand that. But there was two days left. And I just think that the reason um, that he, they got fired when they did is because um, the owner of the Rangers, I think he was embarrassed. I think he was upset about everything 
going on. And I think he was wanting to do this change anyway. And I think the incident with Tom Wilson and it's that happened at the last game really pushed him to make the move now and instead of later. Do you think he was embarrassed because no one on the Rangers um, could really match up with a guy like Wilson? Like, say what you want about Brendan Smith. All right, he went after Wilson the other day. Um, give him credit. But at the end of the day, he's not a tough guy like Wilson. Do you think he was embarrassed that the Rangers don't have a goon like a Tom Wilson or a Ryan Reeves or a Ross Johnston? I definitely think it's possible. We traded our only tough guy, Lemieux, but the reason we traded him was because he wanted to leave. So we traded him to Los Angeles for a draft pick. We have a bunch of new guys. We're in the middle of a rebuild. So we have the youngest team in the NHL. We have a bunch of 20-year-olds, a lot of them coming straight out of college, straight out of the um, AHL, like, you know, all from different backgrounds, all from different places. And it's nice to see. Like, we have a lot of young guys with a lot of potential, but we are lacking veteran players that have been in the league, that know how to, that know the instigators, that know the ones that are going to pick fights. So they don't really have anybody protecting them on the ice. So, yes, I could definitely see that frustration. You know who I really like? A young gun you have. And everyone's going to bring up Lafreniere, Keitel, Adam Fox, all those guys. You know who I really like for the Rangers? Morgan Barron. Like? Morgan Barron, the center. What are your thoughts on him? I, when I watch him play, I'm impressed. I am definitely impressed by Morgan Barron. And once again, you know, we got Morgan thanks to Jeff Gordon. You know, Jeff got us a lot of players. He didn't not just get us Morgan. He got us Keandre Miller. He got us a bunch of players that really have potential. But Morgan Barron, I mean, I was shocked. I don't know if you saw in the game um, yesterday, but, you know, there was a point in time something happened between him and TJ Oshie, and he dropped the gloves, and Oshie ran away. And I'm just thinking, like, oh, my God. Like, this guy's only on his third official um, professional NHL game, and he's ready to start a fight like. with a with a old player, like an old timer, like a player that's been in the league for so long. I was like, you know, he's got guts. Like he's not afraid. Like he's not afraid to make himself comfortable at the Garden. And then you know, I think that game is one that Morgan's always going to remember because it was a game where we did not have a lot of star players. You know, uh, Pavel was kicked out. Kreider was out on injury. Truba was out on injury. Lind- Lindgren was. And then Panarin was out. So, like, you know, a lot of our star players were not there. So Morgan Barron and a bunch of the other players from the Hartford Wolf Pack got, you know, a lot more playing time than they ever did this whole season. So, you know, the game really became let's take a look at next season's prospects because all our good players and star players were either kicked out or out on injury. And that's when Morgan Barron really, you know, took a hold of the show. He got his first NHL goal. He played phenomenally. I mean, he really took advantage of all that ice time and really proved himself to be uh, a really good future um, player and a very good um, prospect for the Rangers. On that point, the Rangers were in the middle of a youth movement. They fired Davidson. They fired Gordon. Chris Drury, like you said, new president and GM. Do you think this signals a shift in philosophy for the Rangers? Like now we're going to start mortgaging the future for some stars or are they going to continue the youth movement? Um, I honestly don't know. Um, you know, Chris Derry, I can see him going either way. Um, I think that, you know, they're definitely going to look to sign somebody that, um, you know, has been playing in the NHL for so long to help the lines with the new players. But, you know, it's kind of too early to tell. You know, we honestly just called up some of our players that we have been waiting to debut this season for the first time ever. And I just think that, you know, there's a lot of different ways and a lot of different options that can play out. Okay. So, um, obviously, the game yesterday or two days ago when the person on the other end of the speaker listens to this, um, immediately I'm talking first puck drop a second into the game, a big line brawl breaks out. Obviously, it was planned. Obviously, it was premeditated. But how did that make you feel, seeing that line brawl right away? I mean, honestly, I wasn't as sure what to expect. I mean, yes, I knew that there was going to be fights. I knew that tensions were high, but I didn't think it would happen, like, that quick. I kind of figured they were all going to gang up on Wilson, not just Brendan Smith go after him and wait till he got on the ice. And then every time Wilson would come on the ice, they would give him a very, very hard time. But when I saw them drop the gloves like that, I actually got, like, pumped. I was like, you know what? That's my team. That's my team that stands up for their players. That's my team that stands up for player safety and for the right thing. So I took a 
pride being a Ranger player in that moment. Hey, you felt how I felt 10 years ago when Michael Haley went after Brent Johnson and Eric Goddard interceded. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, look, Brendan Smith going after Tom Wilson, holding his own. Be honest, how much were you rooting for Tom Wilson to spill buckets and buckets of blood on the ice yesterday? Oh, I was rooting with all my heart. I was screaming <laughs> like at the TV. And you know what? I'll be honest, going into this game, we, we knew that we really didn't have a player that could really take on Wilson. And you know what? Is I Smith commend in Brendan there? Smith. I, I, I there. Really, he did. He did. And I was like, you know, I was kind of surprised that he did. But I was like, you know what? I was like, I don't care. It's just the fact that, you know what, he went for him. That he, In that moment, you knew Smith was giving it his all, making as much pain as he could as possible. And I just I respected that. You know, I really did. Like when he took that 17-minute um, penalty and had to be out, he actually stayed in the locker room for those 17 minutes. I was like, you know what? It's well-deserved. Like somebody had to go after Wilson, and I am happy that Smith did it, you know, because – Somebody had to, and it didn't matter at this point who, somebody just had to bother Wilson and give him a piece of his mind. You know, it's kind of funny. Um, Yankees, Astros, bunch of bad blood there. Rangers, Capitals, a bunch of bad blood there. I feel like it's kind of interesting, the symmetry between two of the New York teams. The Yankees crowd was really into it against the Astros, and the Rangers fans were really into it against the Capitals. I thought what Rangers fans were cheering for and saying on Twitter was dead on. I thought what you said was dead on. Um, Give me your thoughts on the average Rangers fan and his or her reaction to all of this. From what I have seen on social media and from who I've spoken to, I know a lot of the average Ranger fans are upset. They are very upset, you know, this, you know, Panarin had a really, really hard year from allegations against um, then this. Like, it has not been an easy season for him. And I know fans were already upset about all that, so then this just made it all worse and it's the tension and the issues that were going on. I think the average Ranger fan is just really disappointed because the average fan, you know, knows that this isn't okay and that this isn't all right and that, you know, no Ranger fan wants to see their own player be killed. You know, you go to a Ranger game, you know, you want to see your your favorite player, your star player do amazing. You don't go to watch the player be killed. You don't take your kid to Madison Square Garden to watch a player almost be killed. You know, hockey isn't about killing. Like, you don't go on the ice saying, I want to kill somebody today. So I know Ranger fans are very upset and they're very disappointed by what happened. And truthfully, I, I can't blame them. I can't either. I, I think that the reaction uh, from Rangers fans has been fair. I wish I was at the Garden yesterday. I would have loved to have gone. It was at Yankees-Astros on Tuesday. So why not go to another game where the crowd is wound up? Um, So back to Islanders-Penguins fight night, because that's really the only um, recent historical comparison I have to what happened. The Islanders got fined. A bunch of players got suspended. It's clear that the NHL doesn't like a bunch of fights and a bunch of penalty minutes, yet they do nothing to curb the Rangers' anger at the Capitals and Tom Wilson. Do you see a double standard um, in that sense? Oh, I do, 100%. But like I said earlier, you know, politics and money, it talks. Sadly, we are putting money in politics before player safety, and it's it's sickening. It's horrible because if you want that player to make you money and you want that player to bring in viewership, you got to take care of them. Like if they get injured or they even get killed, and then they can't do that for you. So, you know, and if you don't respect the players that play for your organization or play for your league, they're not going to want to help you bring in fans or money and so on and so forth. You know, the only good thing that happened out of, you know, the fight between Wilson and then the fight after that was that, you know, I was seeing teams from all over the league, from the Toronto Maple Leafs to the Islanders 
to Boston to the Penguins, they were all like agreeing and cheering on the Rangers. It was like for the first time in like a long time, or even in NHL history, like we saw all these teams that would usually be sometimes rivals to each other support each other. It was like the one time all these teams were like getting along and on the same page about something. And it was honestly really awesome to see because you don't really get to see that often. But yes, I think there is definitely a double standard. Hey, if you wanted Ross Johnson for yesterday's game, I would have driven him to the garden myself. (laughs) Oh, I would have paid good money to see that. Yeah. So, um, obviously, the Rangers lost the game in the end. Does that kind of lessen the impact of what the Rangers did in your eyes? No, absolutely not. Because I firmly believe that, yes, our goal was – to put on a game and our goal was to show up and our goal was to give it our all, but we left making a statement. We left making an impact. You know, what we did at that game, you know, thousands of hockey players across the world saw it. And, you know, we were making such a big movement. What we were looking at and what we wanted to do and what our goal was, was bigger than the fine even winning a game. And I think that, you know, that was what we took away. So, you know what? Yes, we were, losers in the game with the score itself but we were winners in taking a stance and being the first team to really fight back against the higher ups and say we need change i feel like there is something to the notion that this statement would have been a little more impactful it it was impactful the game was secondary the score was secondary to showing up standing up for yourself not rolling over but I feel like the statement would have been more impactful, even more impactful than it was if you guys had won. What's your response to that? Oh, I 100% agree. I really, really do. And like I said, I don't think we went in there willingly say, hey, let's lose this game, you know, but we definitely went in with a lot of anger. And I feel like sometimes when you're so angry, it's very hard to focus on your playing. It's very hard to focus in general. Like when you're so angry at something – I don't think that you will completely perform to the best of your capabilities or skills because, you know, you're just that upset and you're that angry. And I honestly, you know, we were at a disadvantage. We were out Panarin. We were out Kreider. We were out a lot of people. Um, But I don't, like I said, I don't think we went in there willingly say, hey, let's lose this game. But I do believe that we really did give it our all. But I do think that, you know, anger really does make it hard to play sometimes. I really think it makes it hard to concentrate. Talking to Sarah Albertson, great friend of mine, great Rangers fan. Um, See, believe it or not, I actually can't get along with Rangers fans. Um, The three biggest stories in the NHL yesterday should have been the T.J. Oshie hat trick after his father died, Marc-Andre Fleury moving into sole possession of third all-time in wins for a goalie, and David Backus playing potentially his last game in St. Louis. Instead, all hockey fans are talking about is Rangers, Rangers, Rangers. How do you think the NHL feels about that? Um, I think that, you know, it depends. If this um, situation with the Rangers is gaining them viewership, is making them money, then I don't think they're honestly going to complain. But I know, like, organizations such as the Capitals, that they're upset. They want to show off their player. They want to show off their accomplishments. And I feel like, you know, what TJ Oshie did was amazing. And you saw him cry on the bench. Like, it, it got very emotional. And it's just, like, I think that what, like, other organizations and, like, especially Capitals fans are upset about is that, you know, this whole the Rangers overtook such a special and powerful um, – moment in you know tj oshi's career and it's being overlooked and it's a shame because you know it shouldn't be overlooked you know tj oshi you know just came back after two games after his dad tim oshi died and i can understand like i said from the capitals perspective of their players and their franchise members and their organization how like frustrating that can be um but you know what i you know like i said whatever sells the headlines whatever you know makes the money is what they're going to want to talk about you know, they really, at the end of the day, care about making the revenue. Yeah. Uh, speaking of revenue, and there's no question that money drives everything, um, the NHL is going to get $250,000 from James Dolan because of the statement that the Rangers made criticizing George Paros. Um, I think that's a fair fine. I don't have a problem with that. At the end of the day, you can't set that precedent. 
that it's okay to criticize a league office like that. I'm sure you agree with me when I say that that fine was okay. I had no problem with that. I understand that fine 100%. I mean, should we have been quiet, though? Absolutely not. But there were no. other, I think, appropriate means to go about the situation. That's one of those things where, okay, I'm going to be fined. I get it, but I'm okay with paying it. Like, yeah, fine me, do what you need to do, but I still need to do this for my own sanity. You know, I, I, I really had no problem with that statement. What I did have a problem with was Pavel Buknevich getting suspended a game for the cross-check on Mantha. I'm sorry. There is no way on this earth that what Pavel Buknevich did to Anthony Mantha is worse than what Tom Wilson did to Buknevich and Artemi Panarin. What are your thoughts on that? Let me hear. Oh, I agree. I, you know, I couldn't, I honestly knew it was coming. I think all Ranger fans knew it was coming. We just didn't know how long the suspension was going to be or how much money it was going to be. I actually saw on Twitter that one fan was like, we should start a GoFundMe to pay for all the Rangers fines because we as fans (laughs) support all this. And I got a good laugh out of that. Um, No, I don't think what Pavel did was anywhere as bad as what Wilson did. But, you know, if you watch that replay video, Manfa is hitting um, Pavel with the stick, like, you know, at the legs, at the shins, at the back. So, like, Manfa knew this was coming. Manfa provoked that fight. Um, You know, Pavel was leaving him alone. Like, first he skated away, you know, tried not to engage, but then, like, he just snapped. So, you know, that, what really get bothers me is that the players that provoke these fights, that really, you know, cross the line and start using um, their sticks in ways that they shouldn't and start acting out in ways that they shouldn't, you know, they never get in trouble in these fights. It's like, why don't the people that provoke it ever face consequences? Because they don't, and then they're going to keep provoking and provoking and provoking, and they're not going to stop. You know who does that a lot? Crosby. Yes. Oh, my God, he's infuriating. Those little cross checks, the little hooks, the little trips that no one sees, and then someone goes after him, boom, two minutes, boom, five minutes, boom, ten minutes. Oh, my God, he's infuriating like that. There's Um, some players that think that they're untouchable, and it's sad because of their reputation, because of their big name, and it shouldn't be that way. I mean, the NHL does have a star system, and, you know, I get that. At the end of the day, the NHL is the fourth sport, so you want to keep um, the marquee guys in the lineup as much as possible, the McDavid's, the Dreisaitl, the Crosby's, the Ovechkin's, the Canes. I get that, but at the end of the day, there does come a point where you've got to say, enough is enough. If you guys are going to act like this, you have to deal with the consequences. I'm sure you'd agree with that. I agree 100%. So... Give me your thoughts on the Rangers going forward, specifically David Quinn. Does Quinn survive um, at the end of this season? I, I really don't think he should survive. Will he survive? I have no idea. I mean, most fans did not see Jeff Gordon even leaving at the end of the season, so I think everybody's kind of like um, not sure what's going to happen next. But honestly, like I did not always agree with all of Quinn's moves this season. Uh, You know, and honestly, when Quinn was out with COVID because of the whole COVID protocol, uh, Chris Dury and a bunch of the other Hartford Wolfpack members and the president stepped in to coach that bench. And when they coached those two games, those Rangers played phenomenally. And I think that's when it really was shown to Nolan that, like, hey, look look what Dury's doing. Like, look how good the team is playing. So I, um, I don't think Quinn has a long future coming ahead of him. I really don't think that um, – if, you know, the president and the GM and um, the owner don't get rid of him, I think the players are going to force for him to quit because, honestly, you know, on paper, the Rangers looked like a playoff contending team at one point. And obviously, you know, injuries happened this season. But then, like, we just could not get the chemistry with the lines in order fast enough. So I think, you know, if Quinn doesn't step it up, I think that, you know, let him go if they don't remove him this season, but only after next season. Yeah, on that point of chemistry, obviously this is outside looking in. Obviously I don't watch as much of the Rangers as you do, but I felt like what Quinn was doing with the forwards was just infuriating. You could see that it just wasn't working. They weren't clicking. A guy like Lafreniere 
really underachieved this year. I was not impressed with how Quinn handled his forwards. What are your thoughts on that? I was not impressed either. Um, you know, I was honestly more upset about the defense line. You know, Fox has had an unbelievably amazing season, and him and Lindgren have been partners since day one of the puck drop of the beginning of this season. And then the, the game that we really needed for that playoff push, Quinn decided magically that Lindgren and Fox were not going to be paired together. And I was like, why? That pair was working amazing. Look how great Fox was doing with Lindgren. And then they changed that, and we obviously lost that game, and Lindgren ended up getting hurt. But, um, you know, he's made some calls that I just really don't understand. Like Brett Howden, he's played a lot. Brett Howden, I don't think, has been um, producing what we need him to produce as a center. I mean, you know, every game I turn into, a lot of the times, there's so many different line changes. And I understand that, like, you need to find the chemistry with your forwards. But that's what the summer league is for. That's what offseason is for. Like, you shouldn't be experimenting constantly and changing the lines, like, every other game, you right. know, when you're honestly playing in the league. You know, you're obviously not doing something right in the summer camps or you're not utilizing the time correctly. Right. I'm, I'm with you there 100%. I mean, Harry Trotz does it, not to go back to the Islanders, but Trotz does it a lot. It, it's um, infuriating to me as an Islanders fan. Um, you brought up the fact that Quinn was out with COVID protocols. Um, Chris Knobloch took over as head coach, looked really good. The Rangers played for him better than they played under Quinn, let's be honest. Yeah. Um, do you see Knobloch getting first crack at the Rangers head coaching job, assuming Quinn is fired? Yes, I do. I think during that time when he had to step up, he really proved himself. I believe that the Rangers really clicked with him. I think the Rangers got along with him. I think that, you know, he really does have a good chance at running as long as, you know, he keeps doing what he does. Mark Messier um, called for the Rangers to hire him in some decision-making capacity. Could you see Messier joining the Rangers in some form? Honestly, I don't at this point in time. I feel like if he was going to join, he would have joined like a long time ago. Like I really believe that, especially being a former Ranger and having like um, a, you know, his name's being very big with the organization. I feel like he would have joined a long time ago. But I honestly do believe down the line when Lundqvist decides to retire, and honestly, he is now with the Capitals. But I think when he does retire from the league, that he will look for like a potentially. A, being a goalie coach for the Rangers, and I think that that is a very big possibility that the Rangers will hire him back. I could see that. I could see that. Sarah, I'll get you out on this. I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. What specific moves do you see Drury doing this coming off season? I see him um, definitely pulling a lot from the Hartford Wolfpack and them up because you have to remember most of the season Dury spent with the Hartford Wolfpack. So I think what he's going to spend during his off season is getting the players that he wants to move up from the minor into obviously the and I think he's going to work a lot on that line chemistry, making sure he can find the correct pairs with the newbies and the oldies. I think that that's really you're going to see that happen a lot because you know unlike Quinn, you know Dury is now moving up to a spot where he you know, knows obviously how the Rangers play, but he really, really knows the players and the minors and who they are and what their skills are. And I think coming from that perspective and honestly working with those players, that he'll be able to make a better call on how the line should be set up and how the organization should go about integrating these players into the majors. So you see the Rangers filling most of their holes internally rather than looking outside the organization. Um, I think that they might look outside the organization. I mean, we really do need another center, in my opinion. I think that if they're going to look outside the organization, they're definitely going to look for a center. Okay. All right, I can see it. You want Travis Zajac? You can have Travis Zajac. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Jacob. It was a pleasure. All right, that was Sarah Albertson, great friend of mine, great Rangers fan. Thanks for listening. Here comes the outro. Thanks for the plug, Jacob, from the past. It does mean a lot. You're going to get a New York Yankees show on Monday night. 
Of course, you get regular episodes of the Jacob Volk Show every weekday afternoon. Until next time, I am Jacob Volk giving you a fun fact. And this is completely serious right now. Cesar Geronimo was the 3,000th strikeout for both Bob Gibson and Nolan Ryan.